Anthony William, the medical medium. I'm here with Kimberly Vanderbeek right here. She's seven and a half months pregnant. We're gonna have a lot of fun. We're gonna be talking about everything that our kids, it's like the kids episode here at Facebook Live. So I'm really excited because we got lots of stuff to talk about, don't we? Oh, I mean, yeah. it's in fact, we're gonna, yeah, too much to talk about. <laughs> that's, the, that's the crazy part. We also have our celery juice, which you can drink while you're pregnant. So one of the questions that people ask me all the time, and I saw that, I saw that you guys were asking that, you know, can we drink the celery juice while pregnant? What do we do while nursing? Absolutely, it's incredible because it's got the mineral salts in it and the baby needs mineral salts. The ones that only come from places like celery and uh, spinach and other things like that. So, but the celery juice is amazing. So we got our celery juices, we're totally Mama rigged. needs it too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're totally rigged. <laughs> so yeah, so um, I know you have a bunch of questions. Yes, I know thank you. I have all kinds of stuff too, I, I, I'm thinking about. Well, let's, let's start with pregnancy because yes, we're, we're very pregnant right now. And um, one of the questions that all my friends ask me the most actually is simply what supplements. I know that if you're yeah. eating well and you're eating organic, you're probably getting everything that you need. But what can we add to feel more confident? Well, you know, the whole thing, it's all about a prenatal. That's always been out there. But a prenatal is really, I mean, a prenatal is fine. But it's really just something that's been thrown together with the theory of, Maybe mommy needs this, needs that, needs this, and baby needs this, and it's just thrown into a pill you know, and thrown into a bottle, and we just take that. But that's not really enough, too. So, like, the foods matter exactly. You want to do as many organic foods as possible. You want to get the celery juice. You want to get things like the wild blueberries. The wild blueberries are like a supplement all on its own. Yeah. One of the best supplements for pregnancy is spirulina, like a teaspoon of spirulina every day, mm -hmm. half a teaspoon of spirulina, barley grass juice powder, that's another one too. Yeah. And if you're like me actually, the there are so many powders that I really do enjoy being able to take the tablet form of the Hawaiian spirulina. Is that absorbing? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Okay. That's fine if you have to do that. So if you guys, if you need to do that, you can you can take the tablet form of spirulina. That's a great option. I like those as supplements. B12 is always great. Mm -hmm. So even if it's just like six tiny drops or a dropper full once in a while, that's great while pregnant. These are like, that takes you above a prenatal. That automatically does. A prenatal will have a little bit of B12. It won't even be one that's that great. It won't be one that really is that the baby can utilize so much. So when you take a really good B12, like the one on my directory, medicalmedium.com on the directory, and you take a really good one, it's like you just supersede it. You just mm -hmm. upgrade it, your prenatal now. You just moved it up to a whole different place. Yeah. It's just like a little bit of spirulina. Spirulina alone has more in it than a prenatal, than, than those bulk prenatal vitamins that come from the factory, the old stale vitamins that are all just, they've had them backlogged for 10, 20 years and they're filling all the bottles and all the companies are using the same place to get it. So those prenatals are okay to take, but they don't give you everything. Yeah. And spirulina alone can just all of a sudden be that much more with the nutrients and everything that's in it. So that's really cool. How about uh, barley grass juice powder and iodine? That, that's great. I like iodine. Nascent iodine is a great thing when you're pregnant. All you need is a drop. One tiny drop, two tiny drops. It's all you need every day and it helps support the thyroid. It's really good for pregnancy. I love that. Methylfolate's a good one for pregnancy. So 1,000 you know, uh, micrograms is great. So methylfolate, are you on that one? Did I have you on that one? I'm on it occasionally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then, and then, mommies are busy. You know, you yeah, have, we're busy. You I have, have four, four kids. <laughs> Wait, can I can yeah. I discuss your supplement page on medicalmedia.com? Yeah. So you actually don't know this, but you recommend Mary Ruth Organic Vitamins. That part you know. The yeah. part that you don't know is that well, I know her, and when before we have met each other. I reached out to her and I said, this guy recommends your vitamins. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> this funny. is huge. And she writes me and she wrote me back and she said, you know, this is why I will always trust your supplement page and exactly everything you recommend. She wrote me back. I don't know him, but somebody from his company reached out a few years ago saying that Spirit told him that these were healing 
vitamins and ever since he's been telling recommending them to people I've never gotten a dollar I've never gotten anything or he's never gotten a dollar or anything no. never asked for anything and so from there on out I was like I am scoring the supplement page <laughs> and I am getting exactly the brand he recommends for what thing so. Yeah, well, that's that that that's incredible. I love Mary Ruth's. That's a great one. I love that for <clears throat> I love that for after like after pregnancy okay. too. Yeah. I love that too for after pregnancy. That's a great one to help restore. It's an all around better multivitamin than just the multivitamins you see out there. So yeah. that's that's a great option. Now, one thing I really want to talk about because everybody that has your books and follows yeah. you is yeah. very yes. Let's so check books. them out. Got to make books. sure they're up here. I have all of them. That's one. Mm. And then everybody knows about life-changing foods. The, okay, can we actually show and Okay, thyroid healing? Yeah. These these actually are my number two. Wow. My number one type for number one. And as much as I love that one, that was my first one. This is the one I need the most, so. Um, but I I also want to talk about pregnancy because everybody knows about the tinctures and the healing things that you recommend. Now during pregnancy, some of these things are off limits. Yes. So what are the things that we should avoid during pregnancy because maybe it's too strong and healing for the baby? Yeah, what happens is this is when when mommy takes when mommies take are taking supplements, they're taking them for themselves and maybe for the baby too if it's recommended, but we don't know what the baby likes. That's the whole thing. Yeah. We know what is okay for mom to take or somebody that's not pregnant to take. But we don't know what the baby's doing, or is the baby reacting? Does the baby like it? Does the baby not like it? It's, you know, like with your children, right? With, yeah. with, with children, you know, because you can see mm -hmm. if they don't like something, if something's not making their tummy feel good, and you got control over that. You can't see the reaction when they're in here. You can't see the yeah. reaction when it's in there, so. So I'll say personally, I've been avoiding things like raw garlic and um, most of the healing tinctures. But the bummer kind of is these are things I relied on before I got pregnant. So you had some great suggestions about yeah. how to heal when you are pregnant. And now I'm a swisher. Can you yeah. tell me about that? Yeah, what's <laughs> really cool, it, this is a great technique. What you can do is you <clears throat> can like, for, for instance, mommies need zinc. Everybody needs some zinc. So there's no doubt about that. So you could really do just a little bit of zinc in your mouth and you can just let it sit in there, swish it around in your mouth and you could spit it out. What happens is it goes right into the lymphatic system, it never reaches the baby, and it, and it protects your immune system, so your baby's also protected, because if mommy's immune system is protected, then the baby's protected too. So you can get zinc in that way, versus taking a whole bunch of zinc and a whole bunch of zinc, and it being in the tummy, and we don't know if the baby's happy or not, it, you know, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. But, but zinc is a safe vitamin. For a, you know, for babies and safe vitamin for children and everything, but you're it's always good to be gentle about everything when it comes down to the baby. Like nettle leaf, that's another one too. You can take a nettle leaf tincture, you can put it in your mouth, let it sit in here, and just let it swish around, and you can spit it out, and it'll absorb all through the body, through the lymphatic system, and then get into certain areas. But the baby's not getting inundated with nettle leaf, and nettle leaf is pregnancy safe. Yeah, it's pregnancy. I'm, so I it, have nettle tea back here. It's delicious. Yeah, yeah, and so it's it's what's happening is you use pregnancy safe supplements, but you don't use them in a way that's really aggressive. You use them really gently. You 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 put them in your mouth. You let them absorb that way, and that's one great technique. I love that, especially when moms catch colds. Yeah. And so you're pregnant. You catch a cold. What can you take? And you can do a little elderberry syrup, and you can do this all by letting it sit in your mouth, swishing it around in the mouth, and spitting it out. And, and it'll do the same thing. It'll get into the lymphatic system, get rushing through the body, it'll do the same stuff. And the baby doesn't have to be like, do I like elderberry? Do I like nettle? Do I like zinc? I take the, baby the elderberry doesn't have and swallow it. Is that okay? <laughs> That's okay. Well, it's, it, it's, it's baby safe. It's okay, still cool. baby safe. Yeah. Elderberry is still baby safe. So you're still okay doing that mm. too. But you can also do this other way if you want as well. And so that's, that's just a great technique. I do want to say the zinc that you recommend is so powerful, um, but it's also quite, for me, a little strong. Yeah. So I dilute it with a little bit of water and sometimes add the propolis tincture and it, 
it, it actually is quite a lovely experience. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a strong it's a strong one. Yeah. It, it's it's really effective, but it's definitely strong tasting. And a lot of people, some people don't taste it at all. Some people taste it. And there's 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 a myth out there. Well, if you don't taste the zinc, then you, you don't need it. Or if you if you taste it, if it's too strong, then you don't need it. I think that's the myth. You know, I actually forget what the what the the myth that's going around in there. But what it is is. Regardless of tasting it or not tasting it, your still body can still need it, and that's the mistake out there. So, mm. and that's something that happens where people go, "Well, I, I don't need it because somebody told me or read somewhere that if you if it tastes too strong, that means I don't need it." That's not how it works. Literally, mm. your taste buds change by the hour. If you had a piece of fruit in the morning, your taste buds are going to change. If you had mm. something for dinner, if you had chicken for dinner, your taste buds are going to change to whatever that thing's going to be the next day. So you can get then cheated out of taking something by just a myth of, hey, I shouldn't take it. Yeah. Now, um, what are the foods that you really recommend for pregnancy? I know, I remember, I believe that you talked about mono eating is actually quite nice for pregnancy. So a lot of times if I'm hungry, I just grab a banana and, and get on the road. Um, well, pregnant moms are really busy. They either have children also at the same time. They're pregnant like you. Yeah. I mean, you're running around. You're you're you must be busy and then some. Like to get I, you here, I'm, that I'm was I'm busy and I'm yeah, tired. My like, husband's at home with the kids. <laughs> yeah, and to get her here for this, that you know, I, I was just like, oh my god, she's coming here. That's great because I know how busy you are. You know, glucose is critical. So foods that have sugars in them, because your breast milk is made out of sugar. Big mistake out there in the world. Everybody thinks breast milk is protein or breast milk is fat. No, it's not. Very little, little percentage. We're talking about the smallest. And then, even the percentage they say out there, the science of research says that it could have like 5% fat or 5% protein or 6% protein. It's really like 2% protein. It's really like 2.5% fat. The rest is sugar water. Wow. So that means if you're doing a ketogenic diet while pregnant or before pregnancy or after pregnancy and you want to nurse and you're doing like low carb, no carb, big mistake, huge mistake if you want breast milk because the breast milk is made out of sugar. And a baby's diet is mostly glucose, mostly sugar. That's what builds and develops the brain. Another great mistake is fats build the brain. That's not true. If fats developed brain, the brain, then why would a child's breast milk actually be all sugar if fats actually develop, develop the brain? And if you taste breast milk, it's quite sweet. Yeah, it's it sweet. It tastes like honey with tea. Yeah, so that, that's really important to know. So you want to make sure it's bananas. You're talking about lots of bananas. You're talking about um, potatoes are great. That's a great one. I've run across a lot of problems where moms had trouble nursing, developing, you know, developing breast milk and producing breast milk, and they brought potatoes in, and their breast milk then all of a sudden came back. And before that, they were just doing chicken in a salad. They were just doing something like that. They were keeping their carbs low. They were going by guidelines from other practitioners or other books out there, theories, and they were losing their breast milk and losing their breast milk. I think it's important to talk about potatoes because with Amelia, my fourth child, I was really holding on to the weight. I wasn't feeling healthy and uh, just really, really exhausted. And uh, I, I finally went on the potato bandwagon. And so every night for dinner, I was having a potato bowl. So I, I, would, I would cut up some potatoes, boil them, would add a squeeze of lemons, so just a tiny bit of olive oil. Um, I would often chop up some avocado and tomato on top and a little cilantro. And I didn't really change much else, and I did that every night for two weeks. Um, there were a couple times where I just made it into a fry with some coconut oil. I lost seven pounds in two weeks. Well, on I lost seven pounds in two weeks, I'm and it's not like weight loss was the goal. I re it's nice, we know, we like to get our body back. But I felt better too. My bloating went down. And so I think it's so funny because we're always avoiding potatoes. And I know the postpartum protocol is eat your protein, have your vegetables. Yeah, yeah which actually causes more postpartum depression. That's what that, 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 that's what that'll cause. Because postpartum depression is a lack <laughs> of glucose to the brain and adrenaline issues because it takes that much adrenaline to birth a baby. One of the things research science and nobody knows out there is the amount of adrenaline it takes to birth a baby. 
So it's, it's, you know the fight or flight thing when someone's trapped underneath a car, a burning car, and someone comes and they lift that car off of that person, like they get superhuman strength? That's the kind of adrenaline we're talking about. I believe it. The, <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> so that's the kind of adrenaline that mommies produce, their adrenals produce during, during birth. Yeah. And so after that, you can have the postpartum depression, you can have anxiety, you can have depression from it. You can be like kind of feeling like disconnected, sad, feeling tremendously sad because you have that much adrenaline surging. And what that adrenaline does is it burns away glucose, much needed glucose. So if you're told to go on, hey, protein, 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 keep your carbs down, keep your carbs off, and you're dealing with any depression after birth, you're gonna be getting more depression or it's gonna stick around longer. And so you wanna get the potatoes in, you wanna get um, the bananas, you wanna get papaya in, you wanna get mangoes, apples, peaches, plums, you wanna get a different fruit so you can't have fruit fear. Do you have fruit fear? No. Nope. All right, good. Uh, fruit, fruit is half of what I eat. <laughs> There's no Thank fruit God. here. <laughs> Thank God. That's great. That's great. And it's half of what my kids eat, and they're bouncing off the roofs. They're very vibrant. Yeah. If we don't get our children natural sugars, then what's going to happen? They're going to want what? Cakes I don't understand stuff? fruit cure. I, guys, I don't understand fruit cure. Or ladies. I, it's... <laughs> Eat your fruit. It's so good. Don't avoid it. <laughs> it's still a big deal, fruit fear. It's actually because no matter how much headway we make and how many people are eating fruit now and stuff, it's still that much backlash out there where the information is throwing people the wrong way nonstop. The it's fear, almost like you. Yeah. It's it's hard to battle the fruit fear. The fear is uh, is weight gain. I think that's what everybody thinks it's going to do. Yeah. But. I think, aren't there plenty of Instagram models these days that are vegan and can, can take away that fear? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know... The, you know the half-naked women that eat fruit all day in Hawaii? <laughs> they all look amazing. And they're on fruit, so they're there you fruit. go. That's how it works. And <laughs> so we can't be afraid of that. And it's great for the children. It's great yeah. for the kids. They have to have that. And it's important for development of the brain. It's important for development of the liver. And the thing is with, you know, I have the liver book. You guys know about the liver book that's coming out, Liver Rescue. You can check it out on Amazon. Liver Rescue is critical for people to know about because a liver needs that much glucose in order to keep it healthy. Mm -hmm. And our children, when they're not given the fruit in their earlier days, get lazy livers. They get sluggish, mm -hmm. stagnant livers later on. And the stagnant livers make, that's what causes the high cholesterol, the high blood pressure when they grow older, that's what causes all kinds of other things, sleeping problems, everything. So that's how important the fruit is. It's Well, my next, okay, my next thing with pregnancy, and this has been my big battle this pregnancy, is nausea. Can you tell us, I don't even know what yeah. causes it, how do we, how do we deal with that? It's mostly caused by everything, everything being squished up Okay. Everything being squeezed up mm -hmm. and, and pushing up against the pancreas. So that's what causes the nausea. Okay. So it's it's like the it's the vagus nerve sitting down there, running down the chest, running down into the stomach, so the vagus nerve mm -hmm. and and the phrenic nerves that run through the chest and everything's being pushed up and touching everything. The pancreas gets a little pressure, the spleen gets pushed up really high, the liver gets pushed up to the right. And so all this is going on and there's gonna, and, and every mommy's different. Some will say, I've never been nauseous. Did you ever hear that before? Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so because it just takes the right nerve, it takes the right spot and it takes depending on how the baby's sitting. like. Babies don't all sit in the same spot. Some are just a little bit over, you know, somebody's a little turned a little bit. Some, everybody's, not everybody is in the same place in the uterus. And so the pressure and everything going on can trigger a different nausea issue. It could be in the morning, could be in the middle of the day, could be. So it sounds to me like it is what it is. Is there a way to combat you, it? I mean, how about the pressure points? food is yeah anything anything like that look I like ginger ginger ginger's kind of strong but if it's just a couple of sips of ginger tea or just okay. a ginger chew one of those ginger chews that alone can like just take away the nausea yeah. and but it's remembering to do it like it's it's remember I talk to a lot of moms and are like I keep on forgetting the ginger and it's in but when you do it it could really take the edge off Cool. I, I love myself some ginger tea, and I think it's important actually um, to talk about how I make my tea, which you will probably agree with. I'm a huge raw honey fan. I have been for a very long time. It's a huge thyroid healing food. 
And another thing that people are scared of is honey. But if you get raw honey, it's a healing food. Now what I do is I make my tea, and then when it, ginger needs to steep a while. When it's at a drinkable temperature, that's when I add the raw honey, because honey is so heat sensitive, you don't want to add it to your boiling water with your ginger. Just add it right before you drink it. And uh, I would say that for all teas, right? That, that is a really a good anti-nausea too. The, the yeah. honey is amazing. Oh yeah. Even if you're doing honey and lemon water, <clears throat> so oh, nice. that's a great one too. Okay, that's cool. Perfect. Um, honey is fantastic for pregnancies. There's nothing wrong with it at all. I know there's a lot of controversy in that that one. Honey, you can't give it to little children. You can't give. Oh it yeah, to... I was gonna ask you about that. Can you give it to kids the first year? There's supposed to be something yes, potential you... in there. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. And so it's it's completely safe and always has been. There are so many other things that are dangerous for our babies in the first year that no one even talks about. <laughs> like, just no one even talks about. Yeah. And I'm not talking about like plugs and outlets and stuff like that and baby safe stuff in the house and all that. I'm talking about things that are out, out there and exposure and toxic heavy metal exposure and all these different parks. things. Parks, all the pesticides in the park. Yeah. Think about that, all the pesticides in the parks. And no one's talking about that, but they're worried about honey. Unbelievable. This is this is an example of just complete confusion Wait, out there. Wait, can all of us parents go out there cuz you had a SoundCloud. I've had I haven't even discussed this publicly, but I've had three miscarriages. And I do what I can to eat organic foods and um and, and it's funny because I never thought about this until your SoundCloud. I eat organic all day long. Then I go in a park and I lay on the grass and I roll around and I play with my kids who are crawling in the grass. Yes. And so I called my city by your recommendation to find out the spray schedule. It turns out they are indeed spraying these nice, beautiful lawns. And um, they couldn't get me the answers on the spray schedule. No. And everybody can just go out there and call your city <laughs> and find out when your parks are spraying and ask them. If they will stop, maybe enough places will stop. Yeah, they, because there's no reason. Who cares if there's some weeds or clovers to play yeah. with? The kids love that stuff. Yeah, and the sprays they use in the parks are deadly nerve gases. That's what they are. And, and, and this, is, this is really that bad. And they won't tell you the spray schedule for a reason. Because they spray so often. There is no schedule. It's just dump the stuff. It's like a quota to fill. Like it's delivered there. And if you don't have it emptied, yeah. you get in trouble from the chemical company that's sending you the next batch. So it's just you keep on every other day, all the parts get hit. Well, and I always wondered, <clears throat> can I attribute things like that to my miscarriages? Or is there a... a what, do you, what information do you get about miscarriages? Well, that's a, that's a prime example of something that's really dangerous, that has the potential of hurting the baby, creating a miscarriage, and at the same time, nobody knows or talks about it. And it doesn't, it's just, it's just not even, yeah, it's not even, it's almost like this, this hidden thing, but something else will get blamed that has nothing to do with the miscarriage. Yeah. This is the classic prime example of, yeah. Is it potentially bad? Absolutely. Of course, it's, you know, it's pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. They put the rodenticides in the parks all the time. And they're doing all of that. And it's, yeah, it's, it's really harsh. But we can't not go to the park. You can't not go to the park. Yeah. So you go there, you be careful. And you know what you do? You do your heavy metal detox smoothie. That's what you do. Because if you get the pesticides in you, the pesticides are ladled, they're ladled with like metals, lots of metals, and that's one of the problems. They're really high in copper, and that's the big one. They got mercury in them. So pesticides today, they're being sprayed, have mercury, have copper in it. They have um, even lead, traces of lead in it, and they just spray it everywhere. Hmm. And so the deal is, you're doing your heavy metal detox smoothie, by the way, which is one of the number one questions you guys are asking all the time, I see it on Facebook every single day. It's always there, I'm looking. Can I do the heavy metal detox smoothie while pregnant? Can I do it after pregnancy? Can I do it before pregnancy? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, can. cool. So the things that I have stopped doing is mostly having insane amounts of cilantro, which I love. Um, so can we do all parts of the heavy metal detox smoothie? Yes, you can. You, okay. just, you just don't have, you, you don't have to do a lot of everything. Okay. You could just do a little bit of dulse, you could do a little bit of cilantro, just a couple of pinches of cilantro, a little bit of pinch. And a lot of people, they do that anyway when they yeah. do their, they just put a little of this, a little of that, whatever. If you did a lot of it, it still wouldn't hurt. It still would be safe 
for sure. The wild blueberries, the, the number one question about why not to do the heavy metal detox smoothie is, is it gonna drop the metals somewhere else? That's the, the smoothie's designed not to drop the metals. Mm -hmm. That's how it's designed. It's designed in a way where there's, you've got the five things in there. You've got the barley grass cheese powder, you've got the spirulina, you've got the dulse, you've got the wild blueberries, you've got the cilantro. And it's, it's kind of a safe fault to make sure that doesn't happen. So that's why it's safe. And if you mit, or you're missing one of those ingredients, you're still gonna be okay because you've got the four in there. It's really you wanna keep three in there as the minimum, five is the maximum okay. to make sure you're, you're getting the metals out. And that's what's great about the heavy metal detox movie. So it is safe to use. It's safe for nursing. It's actually amazing for nursing. It's the best smoothie you can do for nursing too. You're getting metals out of the breast milk. What's better than that? Than getting metals out of your breast milk so your baby gets clean, metal-free breast milk. That's the whole point. And dulse, isn't it? Um, the dulse will absorb all the metals and then as they are excreted from your body, the metals come right out with it. It, it absorbs them, but it doesn't excrete It them. doesn't let them go. Dulse, just putting a little bit of dulse, it could be a strip of dulse. Like you could get these little strips and you could just put a strip in your smoothie, blend it up, and that dulse will hold on to the metal and carry it out of the body. Yeah, and it's worth noting that my daughter Olivia sneaks into my pantry, takes out a bottle of dulse, <laughs> and very much so contaminates the whole entire jar by taking spoonfuls <laughs> of dolls. You might be, like you should really give it to your kids. It's fabulous for them too. Yeah. It really is. And there's a concern about seaweeds is is there heavy metals in there? Is there's here's how it works. If you get a big tuna fish, a big gigantic tuna, a 500 pounds tuna whatever they are. And it's a tuna that's been around a long time in the ocean. It's been gathering and accumulating all kinds of metals from the ocean long term and long term. Especially where tuna travel. They travel to real heavy metal laden areas in the oceans. Dulse, when you get the right dulse at the right places, it's in lower, where there's lower pollution, number one. It's got a very short lifespan. It doesn't hardly absorbs anything in the ocean. It doesn't have fats in there. So what happens is that your seaweeds, they're not, they, they don't have fat cells in there. So they don't have actual fats and oils in there. Mm. That's the key because a tuna fish has all that oil and the oil is what takes on the metal. The metal saturates into the oils. They, 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 they find each other and they join each other. You can't get that in a piece of seaweed. So, and, but what the seaweed does, if it ever did have any metal in it at all, it holds on to it, never lets it go. And what it does, it acts like a magnet. It attracts more metal out of your body and even pulls more out of your body to the seaweed and it comes out at the same time. So that's the whole thing. So don't fear a little bit of dulse because you're just gonna cheat yourself out during, due to like misinformation out there. And that's what we deal with nonstop. It's just nonstop misinformation on the internet and in other books, it's really sad. That's why you got to get this. If you don't have it already, you got to get this. I'm plugging my own book today. Unbelievable. You got to get this. And, and I have an autism, uh, aut autism chapter in here, an ADHD chapter in here, too. We're going to talk about autism. Yes. Yeah. We actually, I, I, I was kind of wanting to go in the pregnancy, postpartum, child order. Yeah. But since we're talking about detoxing, can we talk about autism? Because... It's a big one. Yeah, autism is, is due to heavy metals, toxic heavy metals. And what happens is we carry them in our life cycles. That are, we get it passed down generations, generations. You guys, many of you that follow my work um, know that it comes from our forefathers, then our, their forefathers, grandparents, great, great grandparents, and so on. Because back hundreds of years ago, we were getting metals in us all the time. Lots of mercury, that's a big one that's always been around. The medical world used to use mercury in all different ways in the old days, back in the 1800s and even 1700s, industrial age still had mercury. And it goes back even a thousand years ago, the mercury inside of us that are inside our livers, that's why I wrote Liver Rescue to really get people's livers cleaned up. So Liver Rescue, and the, the mercury that sits inside our liver can be a thousand years old. So you're wow. only 30 years old, you're only 25 years old, you're only 40 years old, you're only 45 years old, whatever age you're at, but the mercury inside of you can be a thousand years old and that you want out of you because you just pass it on down. So that's why the heavy metal detox smoothie is so important. But what these metals do 
is they can be responsible for autism. They can be responsible for um, development issues too with children. And that's, that's the thing. So we want to get mercury out of our children. And what I talk about in medical medium is the mercury settles in the canal of the brain. So under, you've got the left and right hemisphere yeah. of the brain. It settles in the canal. And children, the canals are open. So, so by the age of 18, before by, the age of 18, that's prime healing time, right? Prime healing time before yeah. the age of 18. So if you have a child with autism at um, age 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, whatever, you want to get the metals out because the canal's opening and the metals settle in the canal. Science and research don't have a clue about this. Maybe they will in 10, 20 years. But when the metals sit in that canal, you can get them out. After the age 18, it's just harder. But you can still do it, but it's harder and it takes a lot more work. So you want to get your children, you get, want to get the metals out no matter what. Even if there's not any autism going on, yeah. it, you still want to get the metals out of the canal. And I talk about it and describe it right here just so there's no confusion so you know where to go. Yeah. Now, um, I know a lot of autistic children are very picky with yeah. their food. So getting things like dulse or wild blueberries or cilantro barley grass juice powder, those things may be tricky. Do you have any recommendations? Well, first of all, if you get turned down, so if your child turns it down, you always keep on trying. You can't get frustrated. You've got to take one day at a time. I've, I've seen this for years where um, your child may turn things down for a year. Yeah. For a year. But that's okay. That's okay. Because after that year, all of a sudden, something's not pushed away. Something's not turned down. And this miracle happens where, whoa, my child's actually tasting that or I can slip this in this food or I can I have a method for that actually. Yeah, I want that's what I need your help on. You know, and we can get into postpartum in a bit. Um for kids I have some pretty good methods of getting the vegetables happening. So um for the longest time my children were having potatoes for dinner in the form of fries. You cut them as fries, put bake them with a very light amount of coconut oil and some salt and they're happy as can be. They're, they're getting tired of it. So um, what I do to get my kids back on track is, and sometimes they just have platters of fruits and vegetables for dinner. What I do is a, a platter of a variety. Give them all plates and see what they take. Now, if you're not Amazing. commenting on it or forcing anything down, you can observe what they're taking. And my kids hate tomatoes, but occasionally I'll put tomatoes on there and I'll see one of them try the tomato or try something new. This is a little... No. <laughs> Celery juice. <laughs> a little foam. Um, yep, it'll get you every time. <laughs> um, and, and by doing this platter of foods and just observing, it allows them space to make their own decision to try something again. Mm. And by reintroducing it occasionally, I've had a lot of success with that. The other thing I, I do is with the tinctures, I don't like taking tinctures. My kids don't like taking tinctures. I don't like tinctures, taking them. Especially in juice. <laughs> so I have a method for this too. Um, there's a couple different methods. The same one I use for garlic. I take a shot glass size of glass and I put the tinctures in it and add a little bit of warm water and a scoop of raw honey. And I mix that all together and they don't know the difference. And if I'm being lazy, my go-to is not a perfect food but half the emergency packet I know it's chock full well I'm assuming it's chock it, it tastes a little too much like candy to be really fantastic but the honey is the preferred method and the very quick one I do with a little emergency but they're getting their tinctures so that's amazing yeah that's incredible and yeah. that, there's nothing wrong with that at all it's a great technique and it's really helpful and I'm glad you're telling telling everybody because yeah. we need to know these things yeah and also smoothies are a great thing for kids and you can make them taste more bland with you know a lot of banana a little bit of barley grass juice powder a little strawberry and then you can add you know a stock of kale occasionally they mm. might see the color change but they won't taste the change so much so then they don't associate Oh, this green smoothie is disgusting. And then slowly you can add a little more and more. But it's about being gentle, taking your time. And popsicles, right? You do fruit popsicles. Mm. You can put a little bit of spirulina in the fruit popsicles. Freeze that's them. That's a great idea. That's, that's always been a little secret trick to make things happen. And people are doing really cool looking popsicles and, and um, banana ice creams these days with spirulina. 
Yeah, that's incredible. Like the, the I don't know, uh, Bully Raw Christina, she does some really fun stuff. She does, she yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so back to postnatal, where I'm, I'm heading soon here. I really, really, really struggle with post-uterine contractions. Do any of you guys have issues with this? Because I remember after giving birth to Annabelle, my post-uterine contractions were worse than labor. They were so bad. One night I was up shaking, and this is while you're nursing your child, which is, you know, you want that to be a lovely experience, but my body was shaking uncontrollable, uncontrollably, and James had to carry me to the bathroom to pee. And I was just thinking, why can't there be a catheter in my bed? I mean, this is the worst experience. How do I stop these terrible post-uterine contractions that get worse with each child? You know, I like doing like a lot of magnesium. So when okay. that happens, not just some, and I've, I've seen some <clears throat> recommendations out there where do some magnesium. Well, yeah, well, one capsule of magnesium is not going to do it. Okay. So it's got to be like all day long, like a capsule every three hours. So okay. it's like just a capsule every three hours. And if you stick to that, you'll get out of that because they can last. They just not one day. I mean, I've seen mommies oh, yeah. over the years and, <laughs> and they can go two weeks. Yeah. They can go even a little bit longer and then still there'll be the aftershock. It's like the earthquake when earthquakes come and then there's this little after or yeah. after tremors or whatever. And it's kind of like that and it could last. So you want to do the magnesium, like one pill, one capsule, 500 milligram capsule, somewhere roughly like that. You want to do it every three hours. And then even do some natural calm too. Do the powder, the natural calm powder, that supplement. And you can find that at the medical meeting directory too. And you do a teaspoon of that once a day, maybe twice a day. Also a capsule every three hours. And then you want to do raspberry leaf, lots of raspberry leaf. Okay. Now raspberry leaf does does allow for breast milk to build up so it does promote breast milk it promotes the the uh um the the the, lac, the whole lactating and everything so that's what it, it's a promotion for that but what it does at the same time is it calms down the uterus because it's like okay wait a minute we're you know we need a balance we need balance right away it's kind of one of those things where it tells the uterus the raspberry leaf tells the uterus to balance out to chill out and then lemon balm is the miracle for the contract for the for the post contractions for oh, the wow. post spasms for the spasms but lots of it so if you do one cup of ne a lemon balm it's not going to be enough if you do two cups it's not going to be enough you want to do four dropperfuls of lemon balm in the tincture the good tincture and do four dropperfuls three times a day maybe even five dropperfuls three times a day and three cups of tea and you'll get rid of this this will just go away and the and the I'm gonna I'm gonna report back after baby number five. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I'll have my magnesium, my lemon balm, my all oh my Well we'll stuff. do another one of these. We'll do another Facebook Live and we'll in yeah. my bed, <laughs> baby here, <laughs> half asleep. Um, fantastic. So okay, that is actually you're talking about tinctures. I'm looking at my notes over here. Yeah. Um Let's start actually with the first meal after baby. Is there a perfect first meal after the baby is born to replenish the mom? Coconut water to begin with. <laughs> it's a nice meal. <laughs> it's a nice meal. <laughs> it's nothing. It's nothing. You know, uh, what is it? It's totally satisfying. It's not like a food food, but it's. How about a coconut? Yeah, that's yeah, satisfying. Yeah, yeah, avocado is one of the greatest. Okay. Is one of the greatest foods for really helping out. Like those first meals, steamed potatoes with avocado. Mm. Like that right there, that combination, steamed potatoes with avocado, like chopped up and put on top or in there mixed with it, kind of like a potato salad. Like you would have the mayonnaise in a potato salad, yeah. the eggs, the mayonnaise, you don't, no eggs, <laughs> no, no eggs. mayonnaise, but the same thing, that potato <laughs> salad with the potato, eggs, mayonnaise, all put together, chopped up and mixed. You do that with, with potatoes and um, avocado, of course, and you just mix it all together. And that's that's a secret, great secret too for helping as a first. The Amazing. First meal. Now we're both screaming no eggs, and I have to say, and people that have fo been following my account for a while, um, know that I used to be the biggest egg person. I always ate a fried egg and a Middle Eastern salad, which was the fantastic part. But I was feeling pretty bad while I was eating like that. Now I cut eggs out of my family's diet. 
And I saw the biggest change I've seen from cutting anything out of my diet. My daughter had these little white spots on her face. Mm. They went away completely. If she goes to a birthday party, has a little bit of something, they come right back. Um, tell, tell, the, tell the people the, you about know, eggs. And people yeah. are such egg lovers. I'm they the biggest are. one. Yeah, because so they, they taste great. People love the taste. They, they're so satisfying. There's a high fat content in an egg. So there's something soothing about that. Mm. Everybody says, well, it's all about protein with eggs. Actually, no, it's not. If you took the fat out of an egg, no one would ever eat an egg. Wow. No one would ever eat it. And, and so it's, it's the fat content in there. It's just a fatty, delicious, tasty food. And that's why people love it. They don't want to let it go. So it's easy to sell them on it. All you need is to do is put a little propaganda out there on how eggs are perfect food or they're good for you or something and forget it. Everybody's sold because who wants to give up their eggs? But, but when eggs... You, when you give them up, you can, you can you feel can, the difference. You, when you but give them up, you, yeah, can you can heal. You can actually yeah. heal. There's also a lot of confusion out there with gut health issues and intestinal tract issues and SIBO and all these things. And everybody's saying, well, just eat protein, no carbs, eat lots of eggs, have eggs in your salads. Have e No, that's the worst thing. The eggs feed every bacteria there is. That's what bacteria and viruses and yeast and all these things feed off of. It is eggs. In fact, you know, a lot of the stuff was raised in labs a long time ago and was released somehow into the environment. And all those bugs that were raised in labs that now are all in, all in us over time, those bugs were raised on eggs. That was a food given to them in that incubation growing bug stage. So when you eat eggs, if you got something, if you got strep, if you got chronic ETIs, you got sinusitis, you got intestinal tract problems, E. coli, strep, if you have Epstein-Barr, you guys know about Epstein-Barr because you're learning because Epstein-Barr, I, I released the truth about Epstein-Barr, the first person to ever do that, by the way. Don't get confused by the Epstein-Barr information out there. Uh, this came first. And <laughs> the whole point is, is that all these bugs and viruses and bacteria, they feed off of eggs. So yeah, eggs are tasty, delicious. They're yummy, you can do so much with them, you can have fun with them, but they'll cause inflammation. How? They'll feed every bug in the book that causes inflammation. It's really a bad food. Look, I, I would, if eggs were good, I'd be eating them. I'd be eating them, I mean, they taste they great. I would good. be eating them. <laughs> if they were, meaning if they were good for you. you, if they were good for you, I'd be eating them. I know they taste yeah. good. Is it the hormones? Well, the... well, that's one part of it. Okay. So wait, that's a good question. Yeah. So you're thinking, let me get hormone-free eggs. There's no such thing. Or you back can't. Your chicken eggs. Yes, they or... still have the hormones naturally that are in the chicken. You still have that mm -hmm. facet too. So the hormones are a big part of it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of aspects to it. But that's a good question. I know people get upset with the egg thing, but look, if you want to heal, and look, if you're someone that's eating eggs every day, cut it back. Have one a day. Some people like three, four of them a day, cut it back to one a day. One a week. How about one a week? How about one a month? Do one a month. So we started by just having an egg in our Sunday pancakes. Yeah. And we would keep them around. That's how we weaned ourselves. And then um, James is the pancake maker at home. And he started making them with the flax water. Yeah. Uh, you can look it up. There's a flax water substitute for eggs. And they're, it's delicious. You can't tell the difference. They're fluffy still. I make egg-free vegan waffles they're delicious you there's it's yeah you'll get yeah. you'll get used to it that's incredible it still makes me a little sad but i feel well, so much better <laughs> well you know what you could do this thing where hey you just get yourself healthier 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 and then you just have an egg and then you, <laughs> you can yeah. try that you know yeah oh well that's a big blow um so the other question i get from moms all the time and actually yeah. the question i have for myself is if something comes up and you can't nurse, you don't want to nurse, you're making a decision not to, what, for whatever reason, what is the best substitute for human breast milk for, I would like to know, a newborn yeah. or a six month old or like nine, nine months to a year old? I'm not sure if it varies. But well, if you, if you think about formula and the best formulas out there, if you think about formulas, what's in a formula? whether it's a dairy version, of, whether it's lactose, whether yeah. it's a lactose version formula, whether it's a non-lactose ver uh, version, but what's in it? What you'll find in a formula, okay, made by science and research in the medical world, is 
sugar and fat that will be in there sugar and fat that's what that's what the formula will be yeah it'll be sugar and fat it'll be corn syrup oh, yeah. soy oil really yeah that's what's in the formulas so is there something better than that so just think about this say say a mommy could not nurse say you couldn't nurse and you were recommended by your doctor or recommended by some other avenue in the medical world to do a formula and it was like they they've been for the last 20 30 years and they're still out there now is all that corn syrup mixed with soy oil hmm. and some and, and other junk too right so think about that is there anything better than that like if that and then he threw a couple of like old bulk vitamins that come out of warehouses that are 50 years old from World War II they throw that into the formulas it's unbelievable what's in there and it's like oh you got potassium in here oh you got a little bit of magnesium in this formula oh it's just good enough for my baby but it's it's really sad it's not and so what's better avocado banana milk that's a million times better than any formula that's out there if you're not nursing. Wow. It's avocado banana milk. You throw you throw a couple of bananas in a blender, you throw a couple of avocados in a blender, you add water, you can add coconut water, okay. you blend it and you strain it. Okay. And you you got your avocado banana milk. Wow. And that that right there is a substitute. Okay. And is it a thousand times better? than formulas that are you can buy that are in cans that are in bottles out there no it's a million times better not a thousand times better it's a million times better than any formula that's out there now let's take it to the next level yeah what if somebody is in an area where they cannot get bananas or avocados because they're I, I've, I've had a lot of people write me from Canada for example okay. they don't always have bananas and avocados it, it 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 you know the funny thing about that it, it that's changing though even in the furthest regions Alaska I think you can get the bananas and avocados coming up but but what it is is too is like it's 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 about getting them okay so the people that can't get them what happens yeah. is they go to a store it's not there okay they can ask to order it that's true and and that's how you make it happen. Supply and, and demand. It's it's yeah. it's it's a lot of mommies will walk into a store, it's not there, and then they'll just say, Kimberly, there's no avocados, there's no there's no bananas. What do I do? I don't have it and I'm up here in Canada or something. And they're right, there is none, it's not in the store. But they at hundred percent right. But they have to go to the store manager and they say, Just just get on this, get the avocados on the train, I'll pick up a case, ripen them at home, and you're stocked. And you get a case of bananas, ripen you know, ripen them at home. You could freeze them. You could do what you want. You can make all the formula you want. Okay. And how long will that formula last? Do you think? You always, moms have no time. Yeah. You you can do like you can do one that lasts two days. <clears throat> it's so fresh. You want it just a, a daily thing. So you want to okay. get the blender out, throw it in, zip it, and then you know put it in bottles, and you're set for that day. Okay. You kind of want it just for that day. You can okay. make it a night before, keep it in the fridge, and. Yeah, that's helpful for uh, late night feedings. Yeah, so that's okay. that's a great cool. that's a great option. Um, what are the ideal postpartum foods? There's a lot of things out there about if you if you're nursing, you shouldn't eat cauliflower, broccoli, strawberries, oranges, garlic. And I've actually followed these things for the most yeah. part myself. I feel like you're about to tell me. Well, it's BS. Why, why on earth could you not eat an orange? Well, they say that it makes babies gassy and colicky. And actually, that's going to bring up another thing. Because Olivia, my first, right. she was my only one, was incredibly colicky. And it's really hard to parent when you have a, a child crying for three hours at night and yeah. nothing works. So one, what are the best foods for nursing? And two, if you have a, a colicky and fussy child... What do you do? Now, while you're answering this question, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pee. Okay. And I knew this was going to happen. So I'm going to watch this myself and get the answer. So take it okay. away. I'll see you back here. <laughs> so the colicky thing is really a good question. And what you'll find is that people aren't eating cauliflower and broccoli that have colicky babies. It's, it's not like something that's on the main, main list for moms worldwide or in the US or anywhere. What's on the main list is just comfort foods for mommies. So that's the majority of mommies that are out there. They're eating 
they're eating ice cream, they're eating things that are comforting, they're eating foods, they're eating um, cheese, they're eating all these other foods, and they have colicky babies. It's not that their diet's comprised of cauliflower, broccoli, comprised of oranges. That really is rare, and, and it just kind of doesn't, it's just not happening out there. It's, a, it's only just a small crowd that's doing that um, when nursing and, and breastfeeding. So that's the, that's the whole other thing, that's the confusion. So colicky babies have been around for a long, long time and it wasn't because moms were eating piles of broccoli after giving birth. This is, one, this is, this is how you clear up confusion. You use common sense and you use that whole, you know, you, you, you can see if you think about that for a second. What's the first thing? Do you leave the hospital and the first recommendation you get is make sure you eat tons of cauliflower and broccoli and then you end up with a, col with a col colicky baby? No, moms don't eat all those foods. Col the whole colicky thing is from the history of decades and decades of moms <clears throat> eating lots of other things, lots of cheese, lots of whatever, and wheat pasta, lots of meat after they have uh, babies. This and makes sense because it was less healthy before giving birth to Olivia than my other kids. But Olivia actually still has, so I was just nursing her. Did you wrap up what you were saying? I have yeah, no, what I did. Saying. Okay. Um, how elegant of me to announce that I'm going to pee. I could have just said, I'm going to slip away and blot my face or something. But um, She still has the, did you discuss how I could help her as a baby? Yeah, one thing you can do is, is, it, it all depends is the colicky thing goes like this babies it digestive tracts their intestinal tracts they're not fully developed okay. so when they're young they're not fully developed and they can only handle so many things like so many foods that's the whole thing so that's one thing that happens there's lots of different kinks in the intestinal tract that get straightened out as the babies get developed and get a little older as they're you know months older months older months older so you can get the acid reflux, you can get the colicky stuff, you mm -hmm. can get a lot of this stuff due to the intestinal tract not being fully developed, which is perfectly normal, that's one thing. The other thing is sluggish livers. Babies come into the world with sluggish livers oh. from mommy's sluggish livers from the past and mm. daddy's sluggish livers from the past. Oh, okay. That's how it works. Okay. So, and I talk about that in liver rescue, how the whole thing works with the whole colicky thing and uh, the sluggish, we call it baby liver. Baby liver is when you can have the acid reflux and then you're going to the pediatrician and the, no one knows why the, all the acid reflux is happening. And it's not necessarily what's in the breast milk, it's not that you eat a piece of broccoli or something because as I was saying before, there's not a lot of mommies that, that leave the hospital with direction to make sure they eat all these fresh fruits and vegetables. That's not something that's recommended to any mommy when they leave the hospital. No, so is it, time and writing it out or people give their kids gripe water and they find some relief. I mean, is there any way to give your baby a little bit of relief? Because it's usually during a time where they're only having milk. Yeah. Usually it's usually mom's milk. Yeah, it is. And what happens is this, is that there's a couple things you can do. I like the lemon balm for that. That is fantastic because it calms all the digestive tract, all so the, the nerves. Mom, the mom takes yeah, the lemon absolutely. Balm, and then the baby and gets the baby and the baby can get some too. Oh, just tiny bit. Yeah, a tiny bit. Yeah, a couple of tiny drops. It okay. calms everything so that the, the intestinal tract isn't <clears throat> spasming. Okay. So that that that's the key. Got it. Because it's developing and it's, so it can spasm, it's developing. The liver can be also uh, sluggish and starting to rev up. What happens is a baby's liver needs a little time to start firing up and igniting. And it could be delayed in some babies by a month or two months or three months. Where the engine of the liver doesn't quite get to that point where it's, it's cranking up. Yeah. Um, wow. Now, another thing I see on my notes here. Um, placenta encapsulation yeah <laughs> what do you think it's uh, you know I always say with the placenta um, you know of, of, of administering it and taking it I always say to moms it's up to you on how you feel intuitively spiritually it's it's not about you should do it it's not about you shouldn't do it it's not about either one of the it's about a calling it's only if a mommy feels there's a calling to it. Like, not that she's being told she should do it. No, not that. A calling instead. So that means, yes, that's what I need. Yes, I need that. 
like like that kind of feeling where like okay no in the pocket I need that that's what it is and it's not like I'm being recommended to eat placenta encapsulated encapsulated or anything and you know someone's trying to convince you of it being good or the best idea and you'd be like I don't know should I I guess I'll just take it because people are talking about it, people are recommending it. no 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 you don't do it that way you don't get into it that way it's something where you hear about it and it instantly has to click in like yes like you feel it intuitively you feel it passionately you feel like a calling for it and then you may actually be okay and need it but it's like that but no it's not one of these things where every mom should have it and it's just about that I love that you said listen to the intuition because I, when I first heard about it I was disgusted and then um, I learned how natural it is for animals and I became more open to it and so with Olivia I got my placenta encapsulated and actually I could really feel a difference when I took it my husband could tell a difference as well um, but after that with each child I slowly I always encapsulated it so that I had that as an option but I found I took less and less and less and I think with my last child Amelia I took it maybe two days and I was like I, because you I just don't feel like I need it I didn't yeah. I didn't have that need so um, I say across the board for everything when it comes to childbirth, are you gonna be in a hospital, are you gonna be at home, like the decisions you make for your family. I always advocate uh, one thing and that's just getting your information and trusting your intuition. So people will have also different ways of implementing the things that you say f for a variety of reasons. Like maybe if you went all in on everything it might be overwhelming to you and you need to step in gently so i think listening to your intuition with everything is is key it is it's always important to do that yeah. because and and try not to get persuaded into something that may not be the best option too so be careful there because there's a lot of misinformation out there one of the things that spirit and i have done for 35 years now i've been helping out people um every day day in and day out is making sure that you're not getting the misinformation in the in the way of your life because that's how things can go wrong that's how decisions get made that shouldn't be get that shouldn't have been made it's very difficult so using your intuition is critical too because you want to try to use your intuition to try to avoid those that misinformation that's out there as well and and for a lot of moms that that haven't relied on their intuition too where they're so busy and and life is going on and they haven't relied on it yeah. And they have it, but they haven't relied on it. I've always had to be also, you know, that voice of like, hey, no, this is the safe thing. This is misinformation out there until until intuition is developed and it's there. I mean, yours is yours is solid. You got better intuition than I got cooking. I mean, you got you got, you got the real thing going on. You know, <laughs> I have really um, taken time to develop my intuition, and we have a common friend, Peggy Romito. Yeah, yeah. and uh, she's she really helps people strengthen their intuition so I've worked with her a little bit and, and it has been helpful and sometimes it's as simple as giving yourself five minutes a day to just let thoughts flow through you and yeah. get out of the stimulation you know yeah. um, I do want to wrap up postnatal but I, I, I kind of want to recap a little bit as well because I think it's so important so for the most part what we're doing is uh, really needing to replenish our adrenals with, yeah. and and you talk about in in this book as well yeah. um replenishing your adrenals with a combination of potassium sodium and sugars exactly and so having frequent snacks every hour and a half to three big, hours one of the biggest things that plagues mommies with <clears throat> new, that just just birth their babies yeah is feeling exhausted and tired yeah. and there's a couple things I want to talk about a couple things that could happen along with that one is the adrenal fatigue that occurs and then mommies are getting busy well they're always busy but they're getting extra busy there and they're just having their baby and they're forgetting because they're they're worried about their baby's needs yeah and you forget to eat. and you forget to eat yeah you forget to eat. so then two and a half three hours can go by and you didn't have anything yeah and then your adrenals can't restore fast. So then you kind of can be in this tricky spot. So you need to eat every two hours. I, I would recommend every hour. So a mommy should eat every hour. Celery stick and an apple, a couple of dates, 
a little, an orange. I be. love the apple avocado combination. And you had mentioned to me once, just get a bunch of date rolls. And so I have those in my fridge now. And even if I don't have time to eat, I just grab a couple yeah. and, and eat those. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, and that's important to do. Avocado and banana. You can put avocado and banana together. You can just chop it up on a plate and you can snack on it. You know, these are all the cleaner things. They're maybe not as fun as ice cream, not as fun as a piece of cheese, not as fun as something like that, a cheese stick or whatever, yeah. but they are so much better for you. The other thing is a lot of women, they can get that fatigue and then get diagnosed with chronic fatigue where they're just, they're just, they don't have answers. You're going to doctors, there's no answers. And that's when you're dealing with low grade viral conditions. And a lot of moms have to, they are having to deal with the Epstein bar, the underlying Epstein bar. The doctors don't diagnose it. No one helps them out. They're just tired, they're fatigued. They can't get answers. They get told they have different problems. And that's something that also causes trouble for a lot of moms that give that, that have babies. They have Epstein Barr coming on before the pregnancy mm -hmm. or shortly after, and it happens to be the timing of it all. And that's a big deal too. So you want to make sure you definitely look in, into my book so you can protect yourself with the Epstein Barr or catch my podcasts or whatever you need to do. But in life changing foods, I have the adrenal snacks in there, so I have a whole bunch of adrenal snacks. You could do like grapes. Don't be afraid of grapes. That's something like, everybody's like, oh, I can't eat a grape. So you can eat a grape, but you can you could binge on a slice of pizza in two weeks. You know what I mean? Like yeah. people go and they'll have a couple of slices of pizza like two weeks later after they're on a low carb diet, but they're afraid of grapes. Don't be afraid of grapes. It's unbelievable what's going on out there. My kids just love them frozen. Yeah. Just, especially in the summer, it's so hot here. They just eat a stick of frozen That's grapes. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. And you can make the grape slushy recipe you have and freeze those as well. That's, a, that's an incredible recipe. Yeah. Yeah. And so when it comes down to like um, depression from being fatigued, also the adrenal fatigue, and you have the depression after giving birth, do you see that a lot out there? The, do you see? I, I, I feel that a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I see that a lot and I get that a lot. Yeah, so that's the, not that's, so much the depression, but the fatigue for sure. Yeah, that's the adrenal fatigue afterwards. So that's why you have to snack. That's why you have to graze. I'd say every hour you have to be eating something, and it's hard for moms to do that. I totally understand. Yeah. I mean, it's hard for me to do it. I mean, I'll go hours and hours without something, and I'm not a mom with four little ones with another one on the way. Yeah. So. Yeah. I can't wow. imagine. I can't imagine. Okay, so. Speaking of already having four little ones at home, um, how are we doing on time, by the way? Is everybody see, good? We're, we're, Is everybody chilling? I think, we have, I think we have a little bit more time. Okay, cool. So um, I wanted to talk about healing children and healing babies. And um, this, is, this is kind of a sensitive area for parents because a lot of us find out along the way when we're learning information that we've been doing the wrong thing. Yeah. So uh, how can we get our kids back on track to heal? And now I've discussed you know, the vegetable and fruit platter and, and seeing what your kids actually take from that. Um, you know, potatoes, fries that you make at home. But when a child has a virus, um, how, how do we heal them? Well, it depends on what kind of viruses. If you're talking flu viruses, okay. cold viruses, strep, um, it, it's it's a lot more fluids than actual food. Okay. So it, it makes it, it, and the food is all stuff that's light. It's healing broth okay. that I talk about life changing foods. And I think I you know and and it's the healing broth. It's um, it's it's lots of fruit. It's lots of coconut water when you're dealing with strep. When like one of the things with tonsillitis, anything like tonsillitis or anything, they recommend like ice cream for tonsillitis. That's the very thing that feeds strep or Epstein Barr. Who recommends ice cream for it's, tonsillitis? It's it's recommended every day. No. I, ice cream is recommended it, it, every if day. I, if I if I have my dairy slip up. I feel like if there's anything underlying happening with me or my kids, we it, it all goes haywire. Yeah. If we eat dairy. Yeah. If you observe, just observe your life and what you're eating and what things activate, you figure it out. If you have a child that's not well with anything, doesn't matter yeah. what it is, it could be 
um, Lyme disease, which is still, a, a, in my opinion, a mystery um, to research and science as far as understanding that. I have, to have a whole Lyme chapter in Medical Medium Book One, by the way, so so you can actually learn about that. Oh yeah, that was great. But if but it, it, whether it's anything, whether your child's diagnosed with Lyme, whether your child's dealing with all kinds of different stuff going on, or sicknesses, or fevers, unexplained fevers, and rashes, and skin problems, you want to get rid of dairy without a doubt, a hundred percent. It's it's mostly about taking away the bad foods, bringing in more of the good foods. That's really the, really what it is. Who would know what the bad foods are? Because dairy's recommended, cheese is protein, no, your child should be on cheese. Eggs are protein, your child should be on eggs. Yeah. Milk, cheese, butter, kefir, yogurt. Yogurt's terrible for children that are dealing with any kind of illness or any kind of struggle, whether it's cold or flu, to Lyme disease, to any kind of mystery symptom, neurological symptom, to you name it, to tick spasms, to, um, to brain fog. Children get brain fog. Wow. And, they're, and, and, and it gets misconstrued, it gets confused with other things. And they get brain fog, they're dealing with early brain fog. And you gotta take away the dairy, you gotta take away the wheat, the wheat gluten. Why would you need to take away the wheat gluten? because the wheat and the wheat gluten and gluten in general feeds viruses. That's still not known. You guys have to know this, okay? Like you might be hearing me say this and say, oh, everybody says no gluten. All the best practitioners in the world with all the best books say no gluten. Mm -hmm. No, no, they don't know why you need to take away gluten. That's the key. Mm -hmm. They've learned to take it away because of frontier people like me and other people going on for decades doing this, but they don't know why, because it feeds the viruses and bacteria like strep that can cause pandas in children. And I talk about that in Liver Rescue, we got a whole chapter on that. And, and that's what happens is these foods like wheat gluten can feed a bug. Instead, the misconception out there is the wheat gluten causes your body to attack itself. That's ridiculous. That's an example, a prime example of misinformation that's disastrous and actually hurting people, hurting moms, hurting kids. But what it is is it feeds bugs and that's the key. That's what's happening. Now I know there are probably a lot of parents out there wondering how the heck do I transition my kids into eating healthy? And again, the tray platter. And then I had a lot of questions about birthday parties as well. We have birthday parties every weekend. And so how do you navigate that? Well, I have some personal opinions that I wanted awesome. to share. No, I need your um, help on this. Yeah, when we're, when we're en route to a birthday party or anywhere that I know that there's gonna be a lot of unhealthy foods, I give my kids a smoothie. And um, you know, I, I consider us like an 80-20 family. We, we aren't 100% um, healthy, but we do our best. So I give the, our kids a smoothie on the way and it fills them up with something that I know is healing for them. I also give them information. So again, information, intuition, and, um, and tell them, you know, they're gonna have cake there. It's your decision. Um, I wouldn't recommend that you eat a lot because it can hurt your belly and it's not so good for you. And we have a discussion about it. And then the cake comes and they have it. And I found that after a couple birthday parties, what I always did is about 30 minutes later, I said to them, how are you feeling? How's your belly? And they would say, my belly hurts every time. Like my belly really hurts. And so then they started to make the connection together. And this allows them to start strengthening their own intuition. And now we go to birthday parties and sometimes, sometimes my kids won't touch the cake. They're like, I don't want my belly to, eat, yeah. belly to hurt. Yeah. Sometimes they'll have a bite or two and then they'll be like, okay, I, that's it. And sometimes they wanna go crazy and then they pay for it later. And you know what, it's a good lesson to them because they're getting in touch with how foods make their body feel. Yeah. So. That's incredible, and it's really important information because you know we need we need to know that. That's the one thing because the pressure. I mean, you're gonna feel the pressure, and yeah. moms feel the pressure all the time with that. Yeah, and then but also the kid feels empowered to make their own food decisions. Now at home, I I'm not as loose. Like if they have rice cakes or something that I know is not ideal, I'm like this is yeah. not an everyday food. You're not gonna have this every day. Yeah. But when it comes to those events, it empowers them to get in touch with their own body. So, yeah. yeah. That's, that, that's incredible. Yeah. And moms need help with that because that's the one thing I used to get all the time and I still do is, but you know, you're going to the birthday party. Yeah. You're going to, um, 
anything. You're on holiday. What about vacations? That's a big one. That's what I'm curious about too. Yeah. So when the family goes on vacation, what do you do then? Like, what, yeah. what do you guys do? Well, a, lo <laughs> a lot of times, I'm really into Laura bars right now. Wow. Actually, they have um. Are those okay? Yeah, they're okay. <laughs> there's there's better ones out there though. Tell me there's what better, are the better ones. ones. You know what? I'm, I think I'm gonna put a list of them out for everybody out in the directory because there's some cool ones and I keep forgetting the names, but there's really okay. some better okay. options without You give doubt. us some great options. But also, really when we're out and about, a lot of times we just cut up fruit. So I have these snack containers that I fill with lots of cut up fruit and vegetables. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's incredible because um, it, it's, and you know, dates, carrying dates around all the time for the kids, I love that. Yeah. That's a big deal. So making sure there's always that, I mean, having like baggies filled with all kinds of treats. Yeah. So if it's like dates and dried figs and some different, like some walnuts or some pumpkin seeds. My kids are obsessed sunflower with cashews. seeds. Right? The other thing actually that I really want to say is the kids will recognize what you're eating and follow you. So if I'm yeah. eating a salad, they're going to want to have the salad too. Or if they're helping me in the kitchen, they want to eat what they're helping. Like my kids will not eat tomatoes. But yeah. if Josh was help, helping me make a Middle Eastern salad, he will be scooping the bowl that has tomatoes in it. Yeah, so, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. I, you know, if, if your children can actually learn to like avocado, it takes some time. I like the honey in avocado. When you do avocado with honey on it, okay. that's when the kids really start to like avocado. It really becomes like a tr tasty treat because it's like a dessert in a way. So Sometimes that's Annabelle's dinner. Really? She just wants an avocado that's for dinner. And amazing. I'm fine with that. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I think we covered like a lot of stuff today. This yeah. is incredible. I am so honored to have you here, by the way. And I'm, I'm honored to be here. <laughs> I'm honored to have you guys here because that, that's, that's also really special because I was hoping everybody would show up and I think everybody's here. So we're really... And they had some amazing questions too. I yeah, mean... yeah. And we're going to do this again because yeah. we need to cover some, some more stuff. Yeah, it's tough to be a mom. But catch us, catch us coming. Or a right dad. Up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Catch us coming right up on Instagram because we're going to Instagram right after this. So cool. you guys, I'll see you there. Thanks. Awesome.